Um, so yeah, uh, I truncated the title a little bit just to fit on the slide, but I am going to talk about uh, bit reducibility methods in the MOM6 Ocean model, um, specifically how we manage that in a community development environment where we receive uh, open patches from several groups across the country and internationally. Um, I'm going to uh, focus on two particular aspects of our testing, uh, dimensionality and rotational testing, uh, both because they're good representative cases for how we do it. And also I think they're probably the most novel tests in our suite. So that is the reason I chose to focus on those two. And luckily there's some interesting overlap with uh, Aryan and Brad's talk from earlier. So I guess we'll see some of an implementation of those ideas. Um, I, I want to uh, start by acknowledging the co-authors here, uh, Bob Hallberg and Alistair Adcroft. Uh, this is very much the uh, brainchild of Bob Hallberg, um, who had the audacity to suggest that reducibility was possible in an ocean model. And uh, him and Alistair brain brainstormed a lot of these ideas before I came on the scene. And I'm very much the implementer of much of this. So uh, I want to begin by acknowledging them. But uh, uh, excuse me, let me fix that. Uh, I'm assuming my screen's coming through. Um, rather than explain how MOM works, which would be kind of arduous, I thought it might just be better to show what it can do. Uh, this is from our CM4 coupled model, our most recent, and um, it's demonstrating the very diverse length and time scales that we have to juggle when we're running an ocean model. Uh, you can see the comparatively fast and large equatorial waves going across uh, bouncing off the shelves and being generated by the winds and such. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have the very much comparatively slower and turbulent eddy currents in the Southern Ocean and off of the um, continental shelves like uh, North America, uh, Japan and Af South Africa and South America. And so on the top of that, you also see these very rapid whipping things of the um, tropical storms that form. And so, where you have to kind of maintain fidelity over quite quite a broad range of numbers, if you like. And in fact, there's even fa even faster and even slower things that aren't showing up in here, like the very fast tidal currents that are could not even really be resolved on a map like this, which by the way, is the uh, relative vorticity of the sea surface, which is a bit of like a differential rotation of the flow. And, um, and it, there's also the extremely slow overturning circulations that transport um, heat and salt across latitudes to different oceans. So, you know, on top, we have to kind of manage all that. And we use these things in both climate forecasting and in much smaller scale operational tasks. And uh, we have to ensure that these results work and that we can get the same answers as we run them. So um, I, again, I'm not gonna explain how MOM works, but I will briefly explain that what is going on under the hood is a finite volume code for the most part. We have uh, surfaces, we have uh, bounding boxes that we define uh, cells and we manage the transport across those cells. Uh, we manage the momentum transport from the, from the flow such as in the video you just saw. And we manage things like heat and salt and biological tracers and all the things that can either affect the flow or be affected by the flow. And one novel point I'll mention is that the Unlike a lot of the older ocean models, MOM6 has dynamic vertical coordinates. So you see these wavy vertical lines on here. These are actually uh, layers that move in time as the model flows um, in response to the transport. Uh, uh, they were historically developed to accommodate density surfaces so that you could imagine boxes of water flowing around, but they've been generalized in a much stronger sense to accommodate really an arbitrary vertical coordinate. And, um, designing of those coordinates can produce even greater uh, fidelity of things like the tracers, which we need to get those flows correct. Um, another point, uh, th this is a very idealized simulation of a, of a low, um, of much shallower version, but um, it's illustrating that these are also extremely turbulent flows. And not only do we have to deal with the complexities of turbulent flows uh, sensitivity to things like chaotic dynamics, but because these flow, uh, two dimensional dynamics has an unusual feature where flows can move to both smaller and larger length scales. So what we can find is that even the smallest differential values say in the least significant bit of a floating point number 
can, can eventually cascade into very large differences. And you can see um, in, in early simulations, you'll see differences in the eddy fields where an eddy will be in one location versus another if we lose any floating point precision. But then at, at, at longer times, we'll get completely different fields. And scientifically, we presume that the statistics hold. And if you look at the flows we get, they do resemble observations. But in, we, we hope to capture the properties of these things by resolving these turbulence to the best of our ability. And we need to replicate them for the purposes of testing. So that's why it's important that um, we need to maintain have this bit precision when we run these and that when we run them, we can run them again and we know where they came from. So um, these are some motivations for why we do that. Uh, we run these things for very long periods, uh, decades, centuries. Um, and a lot of the flows are very sensitive to the tracking of those tracers. So the loss of heat and energy are quite crucial problems with a model if they happen. And those, a lot of the um, circulations you see are very much a response to those tracers and the fields that develop. Um, so um, it's very, so this is why we focus so much on uh, preserving the bit reproducibility of these flows. Um, so how do we do that? Well, um, for starters, we just, we track a global metric of the flow as it evolves. We essentially integrate the global energy of the model and we store it to machine precision. In this case, 17 digits at double. Uh, so by tracking that over time, we have a snapshot um, of how, of, the, of whether or not we're preserving the flow. And I'll explain why we have confidence in, in that number. Of course, uh, cumul cumulants are very sensitive to error. But um, in addition to that, we also track um, all diagnostics that are available. So all the things that you could measure and output to a file for post-processing. So we track that in a much more detailed way. Uh, we track the minimum, maximum, mean value, and, the, and we track a bit count of the, of the sum of the value as well. So these represent uh, cumulant sums, again, over the whole domain. And um, so we find that that's a, it's useful to keep all four of those rather than any particular metric because it's easy to imagine cases where the min and max won't change, but the field could change. It's also easy to imagine, a little, it's a little imagination to imagine the mean value not changing. For example, if we have numbers that are below the uh, uh, unit of least precision, like for example, 10 to the minus 20 and the mean is order one. Uh, the bit count also is sensitive because if all our numbers got inadvertently multiplied by say a factor of two, um, as I'll show later, the bit count would not actually change. Of course the numbers would. So we find that tracking all four of these is quite a reliable way of managing uh, the solution. Um, so we have a, a pretty complex test suite in which we do that, but I think for the sake of time, I don't have time to discuss it very much, but I will just give a hint of it, which is that we do have a automated CI that runs with every code contribution that we get. Um, we run that through a, nef a number of compilation modes. Uh, for example, we might run one with aggressive initialization. We might run another one with uh, OpenMP enabled. And then of course, some of these other things that you might see on the table. And then assuming those all work, we also run it through a number of tests where we will say run with different initialization settings and we will find we will compare those two answers. And from that, we will infer that uh, the answers have not changed. So we have a number of things, test cases, we call them TCs, but um, uh, we, we also have uh, more site specific tests and we have methods of uh, ensuring uh, synchronization with our, with our other partners, but I'm gonna skip over that for the sake of time and just explain that we do have a testing suite behind the hood, but I wanna talk about how we actually manage these numbers and ensure that everything works. And I, I do see the questions streaming through, but I think it's better if we leave them for the end or maybe after. Um, so first, just a very brief review. I know in this audience, this is old hat, but I do wanna just put everyone on the same page. What is a floating point number? Well, it consists of three fields, a signed bit in the front, a exponent bit, which is the power of two magnitude of the number, and then finally, there's a fractional bit. So it's, it's one plus some fractional bit here. And um, so most of the difficulty comes in managing that fractional bit, as we'll see. Um, the smallest difference is about uh, 2 to the minus 52, or the number of bits, which is about 2 times 10 to the minus 16. And you can also see from this, 
if you play with some of the powers of two, you can infer from this that it does exactly have um, 17 digits to preserve the number. So um, before getting into the dimensional rotational, I thought I would review some of the ground rules on how we write code that is bit reproducible. So the first one that everyone who works with floating point learns is about the challenge of associativity. So if we have a very small number, particularly a number below that, that ULP, and we add one to it and subtract one to it, what do we get? Well, the answer is it depends. So if we add the first two numbers, we would, that number is below that two times 10 to the minus 16, and so it would drop. So we would get exactly one, and then subtracting one would come out with zero. However, if we dealt with the second and third number first, those would exactly cancel, and we would be left with a non-zero residual. Now, again, I understand this is pretty common to most people here, but this is the starting point for all the issues that um, we encounter. Um, so the next issue is so, uh, multiplication is also associative, although the impact is less extreme. What you find is that um, it's, it's because the magnitude is handled as a power of two, uh, multiplications tend to become integer additions and subtractions, which are associative. So much of the magnitude of a multiplier is preserved. However, you can lose bits. You can shift what is meant by the smallest fractional bit as those numbers multiply. In this case, if we multiply one and a half by itself, we get something two, which shifts that ULP up from two to the minus 52 to two to the minus 51. So that ends up with consequences in how we round. So you can see here, um, if we multiply these two numbers, one and, a, uh, one and a half times one plus a residual, we get different answers. And again, it's not so much that we only care about one plus a tiny number. It's that an arbitrary float is going to have, is going to have these, these tailing values in it. So that's why we have to manage these. So what do we do in MOM6? Well, we don't allow you to write ambiguous operations. So x plus y plus c is a forbidden operation in MOM6. We insist that you use parentheses and that how you choose them is a function of both what you expect and performance. So you want, if you need residuals, say, if you're dealing with two thicknesses of layers that are extremely close, you'll want to preserve that residual. In, a, in another case, you want to make sure that numbers could be used and repeated so that they're not lost in the summation. So there may be uh, vectorization reasons to choose one set of parentheses over another. Um, so that's how we deal with the basic arithmetics, but how do we deal with more complex summations like the ones I showed at the beginning in the energy stats and the diagnostic stats? Well, you could apply the same logic of just applying parentheses and doing them in some order. However, you run the very great risk of losing, losing accuracy due to the residuals. For example, if your residuals are below the ULP and your sum reaches that reaches something above that before you finish adding, the rest of those numbers are gone. Uh, we actually had an example of that someone sent to me recently. So that is not how we handle summations. Um, we do a fixed precision method developed by Bob and Alistair some, some time ago, where we bin the number and spread it across multiple variables, integers in this case. So uh, basically we do fixed precision arithmetic like in the old computers before floating point existed. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of similarity to this, to big num style libraries in a lot of languages. Um, but we, we get enormous accuracy with this. Uh, we do not lose, ac we lose accuracy. Let's say, um, well, first of all, we get answers that are by all accounts independent of order. So we don't need to worry about um, where we, you know, how we gather them up. But also, it can safely be passed through things like MPI, where we're gathering up these numbers. Um, and, the, and also, uh, the accuracy is quite low. Sorry, sorry the, loss, the loss of precision is quite low. It tends to be bounded by the, by the largest error inside the terms, rather than the, any sort of cumulant. Um, on top of that, I will say, it does mean we cannot use the intrinsic sum operation of Fortran because that is an ambiguous operation. We don't know what the compiler or the anything else is going to do with that sum. So we have to basically give it up. Um, and another example of that is in the use of transcendentals. Um, 
you know, one of the great things about Fortran is it does provide all these functions. It provides summations, min maxes, uh, trig trigonometric functions. However, we, we cannot use them safely. Um, this was an example of one where we were calculating what is the uh, Coriolis uh, force parameter. And um, we found that there was a system update on our libc library that changed the libm. And we had a bit change on a few specific values. And it, it, call, it caused all our operations to ground to a halt that day. And it took us, we had to kind of troubleshoot where it came from and we worked it out. But um, it, it left us with a difficult choice. Like um, for the most part, we don't rely on these transcendentals. However, uh, we mainly only rely on them on things like setting initial states, like say uh, defining a topography for a flow or, or something. But um, when we use them, we have to know where they came from. You know, um, G, G Fortran will pull from libm. Uh, I don't think other compilers will do that. They'll have their own versions that they think are better. But unfortunately, we cannot really enjoy the benefits of this. Um, a third example here is in how we evaluate higher order powers. So we, we have places where we, we have parameterizations where we need to evaluate, say, um, depths to the sixth power. Well, we know we can't write it out as six multipliers because that's ambiguous. We don't know how the operation is going to be done. We, can't, we also cannot write it using Fortran's power operator <laughs> because we don't know what they're going to do. They might do this. They might explicitly do it out. They might use a libm pow function. Um, it may do its own magic. So we have to manage that as well. So how do we do it? Well, we do write it out, but instead we split it into two steps. We define a um, cubic, and I'll leave it as a homework for why we don't need parentheses on that first one. And then we multiply the cubes together to get a six, whatever you call it. And uh, finally, another interesting uh, challenge that we have to juggle is the negative zero. Now, for floating points have a sign bit, so negative zero exists. I will not comment on the merit of that, there are people who like it. There are people who think it's dumb. Having said that, um, it, it is a problem we have to manage because it will change our bit count. Now, if you're not familiar with it, if you take a number and multiply it by zero, positive zero, you get positive, excuse me. If you take a positive number multiplied by zero, you get plus zero. Take a negative number times zero, you get minus zero. So these are very difficult to manage actually because the floating point standard bends over backwards. It goes out of its way to make sure that negative zero is for all practical purposes identical to zero, except for a very, very, very few fridge areas like some transcendentals with branch cuts and stuff. So having said that, we do like these and we do track them because they're a very useful method of detecting an unexpected number. For example, if a number that we were not properly managing, say through initialization, changes sign, we will detect that through the appearance of a negative. We could detect that through the appearance of a negative zero. So we take these seriously and we try to remove them. However, we have found scenarios where that's just not an option. For example, um, the min function in, in at least one implementation of Fortran, if you take the min of minus zero and plus zero, the answer you get will depend on the order of those arguments. And then if you try to compare that with say MPI's minimization, it will give a different answer and it will have different rules from at least from what we saw. So we found a back door. If we have a negative zero that we are sure we cannot manage, if we add plus zero to it, we get plus zero. So that is our trick that we employ when necessary. But um, that is yet another uh, chapter in the saga of trying to juggle uh, reproducibility of, of bits and floating point numbers. So that's the uh, background for this. And so I will now get into how these tests actually work. Um, so the di dimensional consistency is, um, uh, so you saw that in the first talk. Um, this is an example of an expression from our equation of state for seawater, which has a lot of terms. It has accelerations, it has lengths, it has depths, and it has densities and all sorts of things. And so how could we really make sure that that formula is consistent? Well, we use a trick, uh, which, which Bob really pushed, um, which is remember that the power of two multiplication is associative, unlike the fractional bit. So what it means is that we can pre-multiply numbers by powers of two to some, to some power and then go through a calculation and then finish with a negative power of two and get the same number. 
So that ends up being a proxy for a way to insert dimensions and detect them. So for example, if I have this simple stepping formula here, just, just simple acceleration, uh, if the f is a forcing and the u's are velocities, uh, the u's would scale like two to an L minus T, which would be like length over time. T would scale like time and F would scale like an acceleration, which would be L minus two T. So you can see that if this was a dimensionally consistent formula, these terms would all cancel. If it were not, then we would see a change in our answers and we would flag that and fix it. So it's not just a matter of focusing on MKS units, however. So this is, a, this is a, a very idealized formula that we use in oceanography called the shallow water model. In this case, if we were to apply a formal scale analysis on this, like say in a um, Buckingham Pi theorem, we would see that there, is a, there are three dimensions to this, to this formula. There is a length, horizontal length scale, a time scale, and a thickness, a vertical thickness scale. So even though L and H would have the same MKS units, they would scale differently in our model. An example of that is velocities could be formally inferred to have units of L over T from this, but the accelerations G would not be L over T squared, but L squared over T squared H. And so we can define units a little more formally in terms of scaling in our model. And this is very similar to how we do it in MOM6. MOM6 is more uh, complex than a shallow water model, but it captures this idea. So uh, these are the current dimensions we implement in MOM6. We have the time units, length, horizontal length, but we actually have three length scales. We have a horizontal length scale, a layer thickness, which would represent the vertical size of those finite volume units between the, the layers. But then we also have to track at times where those things are relative to say a reference depth. So we have a vertical, an absolute vertical length scale that scales differently from the thickness. So this is why it's quite important for us to be able to define our own dimensions and to benefit. And we also have uh, density here and enthalpy, which is sort of our proxy for heat or temperature. I won't get into why or how that works, but um, that is an example of the units we have. Now I, I, I'll rush over this, uh, but um, this is how we implement it. Um, we don't do it all throughout the code. That would be a performance bad, that would be a mistake. <laughs> So instead, what we do is we scale these things as they come in. So these are our input parameters, like for example, our time step. We would scale that to from its MKS unit, which we do, which we do define as our inputs, and we we would power to that to some arbitrary time scale. Similarly, when constants appear in our in our code, which are becoming a endangered species, I should say, as we move everything to parameters, but when they do exist, we scale them in C two. So um, all constants, we do not have um, naked numerical constants. We only have dimensionally scaled constants, unless of course they don't have dimensions. Uh, finally, um, this, is, this final function would be an example of where we save the output. And um, that would be where we would undo this scaling. So you can kind of see how it would work in our model. And perhaps it's considered too tedious uh, relative to the examples in the first talk, but it's proven very effective for us. Uh, so uh, that's into, for the excuse me, you're into your discussion time. Oh, am I? Oh, okay. Uh, do you mind if I just rush through the rotational? Okay, part? yes, carry on. Okay. But be aware okay. that we've only got little time left. Yep, I will do that. Thank you. My timer was off by a few minutes. Um, so uh, just an example, we also deal with rotational consistency. You can see very large expressions like this would be with a lot of variables and indices and are difficult to track. Well, how would we manage it? Well, we run the model at different rotations. Um, I'll skip over some of this for the sake of time, but what we're actually doing is more of an index rotation where we're not necessarily rotating the model. We're actually even rotating our coordinates as well as the fields, but we are sort of changing where it lies in memory. So that's why I like to call it an index rotation. Uh, again, as with the dimensions, we do this on the inputs and outputs, but we don't do it inside the model. The model does everything on the rotated domain. And um, there are separate rules for how we handle uh, scalars, pairs of arrays, such as values on the faces of one of those finite volume cells, and finally vectors, which we have to manage signs. So we have to know what it is we're rotating at the time. And um, finally, uh, the very last point I'll raise here is that we have to define our stencils to be rotationally symmetric. 
So in this case, if we were to just add up the values, say, on the north and south faces before summing to do an interpolation from the corners to the middle, we would have a rotationally non-invariant uh, stencil. So instead, what we do is we sum the diagonals in this case when we need to interpolate from corners to centers. Um, and then finally, when all else fails, we can just reverse the order in which we do our steps. That's a last resort, though. We only do that when the code's gotten too big. Um, I have examples here of where we've done that, but I'm going to skip it for the sake of argument, it's for time, excuse me. Um, the talk is online. You're willing to look through it. Um, last point I want to make is that we know that we're, we, we're doing this with eyes wide open to some extent. We know we're suffering here. We know we're forfeiting the right of the compiler to do things that maybe we don't have the wisdom to see. Uh, we understand that, but reproducibility is too important to us to give up. So we try to balance those needs. I will not, I, nothing I've said is not on this summary slide, so I'll leave it there. Um, but hopefully um, I didn't rush through that rotational part too much and you caught the gist of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I'd like to pick up uh, a question that Harvey Richardson made. Uh, which is, uh, he, he remarked that it seems to be climate change modeling that comes up with this. And that was my experience as well. My first uh, encounter with it was somebody from the Met Office in Britain who wanted this. Yeah, so the, the, the question UK is, model. Oh, sorry. Is, is anybody, are, are there any applications for this in other areas? I think the methods we've outlined are general enough to work anywhere. Uh, certainly the reproducible sums I think the UM, the UK weather model, does use something very similar in their summations. Uh, previous versions of MOM have also done focused on reproducible sums. I, I certainly these ideas work, should work in other situations, and not just climate, but anybody who cares about this. Um, I think, though, a lot of previous models would lock themselves down to a compiler and to a set of libraries and to a version and you know, they would, they, they'd feel very constrained and sometimes even nervous about how to maintain the reproducibility because of that. I think the steps we take here um, do outline that you can relax a little bit if, if, you, if you try to remove some of those layers of uncertainty in the language itself. So I, I think that answers your question, or his question, excuse me. Another question I had from Thomas uh, Hayward Schneider if you forego reproducibility, you lose the ability to see the effect of small changes might have on the on the way the whole thing progresses. Do you have any comments on that? I do. Um, nothing. I, I agree with the point. Um, having said that, I don't know if that's that's what you want. I mean, it's kind of like saying by giving up some level of control, I gain wisdom in the in the variations that I see. I very much think that there is truth in that. We would be we would be well served um, inserting noise into these. But in my opinion, I'd rather do it deliberately than just rely on the fact that that it can happen from time to time. I hope I hope I've captured the essence of that question. Um, feel free to, to uh, respond to that. Well, close enough. Thanks. <laughs> I'm afraid time's up. I'm sorry about this. I found it a fascinating talk, and I'm sure we could carry on with questions for quite a while. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, it's time to I, move I, on to the next speaker. Thank you. I'll try to address things in the chat. Thank you.